Ian Fanonius is an iconic underground rock musician, writer, and cultural critic. His performances are generally characterized by antics and theatrics, and his polished work communicates an anti-capitalist message. Ian has been mainly notable in the singer, as the singer of various bands, including the very influential in the DC punk scene, Nation of Ulysses, followed by The Makeup, We're War, and Chain and the Gang. Vinonia's various solo projects include the 2001 album Play Power, under the pseudonym of David Candy, a number of articles about political action, and the books The Psychic Soviet and the Supernatural Strategies for Making a Rock and Roll Group. The Psychic so Soviet it was published in 2006, and it's a collection of 19 essays that comes with instructions that preface the book that escape it should clear up much of the confusion regarding events of the last millennium in, artistic, in the artistic, geopolitical, and philosophical realms. It encourages the reader to refer to the book in case of ethical predicaments, feud, and social conflict. His subjects go from the ascent of the DJ as a star to the cosmic depression that followed the defeat of the Soviet Union in the Cold War. The supernatural strategies for making a rock and roll group is a how-to guide to starting a group inspired by cooking shows that are trying to demystify cooking. This charmingly neurotic guide dives into the esoterical nonsense by challenging the spirits of dead stars, such as um, Brian Jones and Jimi Hendrix, to instruct the reader on how to build a better rock and roll group. He morphs the importance of instrument practice into a discussion about the being, via contact is why Viet contacts prevail over those of the U.S. Army and how the drug use in bands is linked to geopolitical trends. He also has an online talk show called Self Focus, shot at the Guggenheim Museum, in which he interviews artists and musicians. And of course, we're very excited to have you here. And so please join me welcoming Ian. Of propagating the lies of freedom and liberty, 
of high treason and of cruelly abusing the trust given to it by its enthralled, mesmerized, and beholden constituency. This trial is both a great responsibility and quite an experimental judicial proceeding. After all, what is rock and roll? What is the state of your accusing of such heinous acts? We defer to an expert on the subject, Dr. Fran Fine, chairperson of the Phonophobic Society. Rock and roll is a music form or sound, yes, but it is also a vain and insidious ideology which seeks to impress itself into the very DNA of the minds, souls, and societies it implicates. It is a music that drives its listeners to insanity and antisocial behavior, and which co-ops and exploits insanity for its own uses. It is a form which, exported around the world, serves as a soft weapon for the ruling clique to propagate a capitalist ideology and all its loathsome and tenets. Liberalism and individualism, selfishness, so-called liberty, anti-intellectualism, and perhaps most destructive of all, coolness, aka the blasé attitude which displays contempt for compassion, caring, community, as well as both intellectual and emotional engagement. Brand loyalty, misogyny, imperialism, and supremacism are other toxins which are celebrated by this vicious and callous musical bacteria. Rock and roll is intolerant. It demolishes all other culture than itself by being almost entirely undefined. It can successfully integrate local forms and pervert them for its own uses, thereby destroying all difference in the world and making new markets easier to incorporate and control under a single hegemon. It enjoys a detached relationship to suffering and insanity, whereby these forms are realized as stage and appreciate actual experience suffering. Thank you, Dr. Fine. Where is the evidence for such crime? The evidence of guilt, total and cold-blooded, is in the groups of the records themselves, on the airways, confessed, even bragged about, at high volume by the notes, songs, tunes, and images of the party. Let's take a look. All the evidence we need to prosecute this case has been represented in the music contained on these record albums and in the statements made by rock and roll authors, the sidelines and drug abusers of the last 50 years who have brought civilization to the precipice of ruin with the ideology of selfishness and individualism. Indeed, rock and roll is a neo-satanic form which worships not only pleasure and immediate gratification, but idolatry, personal gain, and is, in its use by the ruling clique, a Trojan horse, a delivery system for imperialism and capitalism. The evidence. Listen. <laughs> Plastic products. 
dissociated uh, piece of information um, in one performance and uh, they don't seem to complain, complain too much. So that's what I'm going to do. I'm not going to give you one lecture. I'm going to give you 11 lectures. A rock and roll band typically plays between 8 and 13 songs. So I'm going I'm to give 11 lectures today. Um, they, they're not necessarily going to be uh, related to one another, but some of them will be. Um, I'm going to pass out the set list so you guys can <laughs> um, pass it back. And if somebody gets it, uh, doesn't get one, you have to share with your neighbor. So, um, 
groups are full of dissociated information. There's uh, the fractured noises, the nonsensical gestures, and um, the nonsense lyrics. Um, the groups are unconsciously avant-garde and difficult to comprehend. So um, anyway, after my set of 11 lectures is finished, um, if it's successful and you demand more, I might do an encore lecture. <laughs> it might be a classic lecture by, by our author. Uh, I may or may not announce the authorship of the covered cover lecture. Anyway, so the, the lectures are generally about um, the uh, artist, the artist, because we're an artist. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to maintain your attention. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, uh, I mean, it's enormous. tracks of the rock and roll so we're going to have a little light show. Um, in the style of uh, the family dog. First lecture. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I That's pretty cool. Okay. So my first lecture is going to be uh, called <laughs> the artist relationship to the eternal. Okay. to 
God for his pain master. The artist relationship with the The kingdom of heaven was, along with God, thrown in the dustbin. Immortality became a privilege of the bourgeoisie, attained through portraits, names on buildings, patronage, corporate legacy, and nowadays, wheatgrass. <laughs> <laughs> through the artist's portrait, the rich could be immortal. For the poor, there was no longer any escape from the horror of death. The mean-spirited bourgeoisie took away their hope. The bourgeoisie's pet, the artist, is often likewise seen to be in a quest for immortality, in their case, through a great painting or work of art. Leonardo attained a kind of immortality through his portrait of Mona Lisa, for example, though his status was at the whim of his employer. To seize power, the middle class had required the demotion of the church and the clergy, who had explained the divine right of the aristocracy. But in this necessary reduction of God and simultaneous celebration of science, they closed the old avenue to eternal life, even to themselves. Becoming a god on earth, therefore, became the goal. This required total control of the population and the earth's resources, the transformation of the world through science, technology, and construction accelerated at a traumatic, cataclysmic speed. But the single most compelling argument for the elite as living deities would be if they could appropriate God's great breath, Armageddon. The artist's role as explainer of bourgeois power was central to all of this. Their art would mirror each and every permutation. The artist would be the shock truth for the capitalist's ideological indoctrinations. The artist relationship with TV and
the artist. It's called the artist. The vampire myth started in the 18th century in Eastern Europe, an area which has had a third world relationship to the, to the West ever since the Crusades. The Crusades weren't only an invasion of the Holy Land, but also included colonization of the Baltic states and the sack of Constantinople. The countries of the East, having never experienced their own bourgeois revolutions, were and still are resource in, resources and markets to be colonized. Therefore, they fostered suspicion, at first, of the artists who were heralds of a new invading class of exploiter. The vampire legend, popular throughout Eastern Europe, was a manifestation of the fear of the new artist class and of the artist's portraits. The portrait painter was creating an immortal image, immortalizing their subject, and becoming immortal themselves with their signature, which, since the bourgeois ascension known as the Renaissance, had become a feature of their work. In the East, there was a great fear of people immortalizing themselves outside of the domain of God. God was the only one who could grant immortality. The portrait painter was committing blasphemy because they were helping someone live forever outside of the ages of God. Therefore, the portrait painter was to Christians apostate. There is a cliche of the Aboriginal people of Australia believing that the camera will steal one's soul. Oh, shit. <laughs> the artist. <laughs> um, there's a cliche of the Aboriginal people of Australia believing that the camera was stealing its soul. The portrait painter of Yor was likewise seen as a soul stealer or vampire. The East had historically been suspicious of portraiture and the immortalization of a person. The famous iconoclast struggles of the Middle Ages, which centered around destruction of graven images, had torn apart the Orthodox Church in the ninth century, leading to a disruption which allowed the Vatican to break free of Byzantine authority, and which led to the East-West Schism, which is a defining feature of modern times. The struggle between Western Catholic and Eastern Orthodox is the backdrop to imperial conflicts, such as the bombing of Yugoslavia, the Second World War, and the current U.S.-designed conflict in Ukraine. In these struggles, capitalist powers like NATO and the Nazis fight on the side of the Catholics, while the communist Serbs and pro-Russian separatists are on the side of the Orthodox. It's no coincidence that Pussy Riot, who are hero celebrities in the West, and party with Madonna, began their struggle with a desecration to an Orthodox church in Moscow. Pussy Riot are the central pieces in the current push to suppress and recolonize the East. Stars of the West's propaganda campaign against Putin, they're the exemplary rationalization to liberals for a possibly armed confrontation with a nascent Russian state, which the so-called West elite despises for its gas wealth and relative autonomy, as opposed to European governments who are servile bootlegs to US hegemony. Dracula was a story appropriated by Bram Stoker from the myths and folk traditions of Slavic countries. Stoker set his story in Romania, but it could have been set anywhere in the East. Vampirism is a poignant story not just because it's sexy and scary, but because the vampire is a victim too. The vampire is a bloodthirsty creature who looks for prey, but they too were a victim once themselves a hapless dupe seduced by a thirsty, immortal undead. This perfectly illustrates, illustrates the conundrum faced by the artist under capitalism. The artist is the end of All right. Thank 
<laughs> Besides the vampire, another immortal being is the ghost. While the painter might be vampiric, their successor, the recording star, could be described as this kind of creature. When musical performers began to record in the 20th century, the visual artists turned to abstraction. They no longer had the ability to steal souls and turn their energy to immortalizing themselves instead through shapes, color, and dissociated collage. Meanwhile, records blurted out the trapped moments of rapture, fear, love, anguish, despair, excitement, and insanity. Instead of the portrait's stoic, vampiric immortality, the records were ghosts, repeating some strange tantrum for eternity. When a record plays, it is a ghost wailing, imprisoned in the moment. <laughs> Rattling with the chains. Groups, graven images, and output are likewise ghost-like, attempting to wreak their vision in the world from the afterlife, but without a physical body, they must rely on real-world minions, not unlike Dracula, who had insane slaves such as R.M. Renfield, who in Stoker's book famously ate flies in the asylum while worshipping the vampire. Every fan is a little Renfield, who alternately <laughs> raves and obscures their favorite group or record. That which they see is the light and hope for the earth, but also their precious, illicit, and contraband discovery. <laughs> the artist is <laughs> It mimics the rattle from some tragic old ghost and attempts to breathe life into their actions, repeating their momentary tantrum, which is tracked forever on a playable disc. The artist's painting is square and self-contained, but the record is round and forever revolving, seems to move quickly but actually goes nowhere. The record is sheathed in a cover which is square in an attempt to mimic fine art and appear complete and contained disguising the dark and horrific drama of the captured soul, which rotates in a gyre. The recording process is a conjuring of magic, therefore, and as such is regarded suspiciously by some, who are less rooted in capitalism's gizmo conjuring production paradigm. The Eastern Europeans, who first recognized vampirism, might be wary of the damnation which could follow electronic recording. The song, as a bizarre repetition, is another flirtation in death and its bedfellow, insanity. The recording group might live a long life, but once it's been recorded, it is a walking undead, tethered to a material manifestation of a particular moment in time that it must repeat again and again. Some groups go unnoticed and fail. Ultimately, they are the ones who are free. Successful groups are like legendary ghosts who have to perform their stunted emotional moments for their entire lives and on into death. <laughs> the artist is Alright, the next lecture is called Front Groups. Will fanzines be the culture for World War III? <laughs> Sometimes groups, front, front groups. <laughs> Okay. Sometimes groups refuse to write songs or record, such as Pussy Riot from Russia, <laughs> whose inspiration came from performance artists, British skinheads, and the fanzines of the U.S. feminist rock underground, as opposed to its music. Those fan scenes were partially inspired by the group Nation of Ulysses, which had, which had, a, newsletter, which had a newsletter combining Black Panther-style rhetoric with futurism and situationist tracks. That fan scene, Ulysses Speaks, was one impetus for the right girl groups to make their own fan scenes. <laughs> while, while the Ulysses fan scene was fantasist and outrageous, the right girl fan scenes were rooted in first-person narratives and classroom jargon from the academy. Though they borrowed the militant posturing of the 
nation of Ulysses and its political organizational pretensions. <laughs> the vampirism practiced by the U.S. state in co-opting the group as terrorist political organization via its front group, Pussy Riot, is the most cliched and predictable version of blood-sucking appropriation. Yet, since Pussy Riot don't make records, they are not yet dead, and therefore have real potential to wreak the nuclear apocalypse long promised by the rock bands, who, wailing from another dimension, have thus far been delinquent and ineffectual in their delivery. Pussy Riot, more than anyone ever, are the embodiment of the rock and roll paradigm. They produce nothing, they do nothing, and are to their audience incomprehensible. Yet they may have engendered a world war through a gesture of nihilism and defiance. In explaining and creating a framework for liberals to applaud U.S. intervention against Russia, a desperate nuclear power, these artists have attained the apocalyptic god status typically reserved for the most elite bourgeoisie. In this, in this manner, they may be the most powerful artists ever. Pussy Riot are a singular group and cannot be enlisted to play a festival or join a package tour as they have no records. As per the rock and roll art type, they are alone. It's lonely at the top. <laughs> this loneliness has been a prescription needed out by rock and roll and visual art since its beginning. Will fanzines be the culprit? For World War III. Thank you very much. Thank you. halfway point, does ever, do, do people need to get up and stretch? <laughs> <laughs> this is the halfway point. All right. The next one, the song is, uh, this lecture. The, the vampire's seductive power comes from their ability to suggest their charisma and hypnosis. Similarly, the rock and roll artist's intention is, through a repetitive invocation, to control a population's moods and actions. This could take the form of an innocent-seeming dance instruction. Sam Cooke's song, Twist in the Night Away, 1962, for example, describes a scene where all ages, creeds, colors, ideologies, and class types are united in a utopian scene of unbridled excitement. An older queen, a chick in slacks, and a man in evening clothes all gyrate together in erotic abandon. They lean back, they fly, they wait to what you see and hitchhike, but they never touch. Despite the optimism and joy of the tune, Twisted promulgated a new world of utter isolation and individualism. Sam Cooke's twist song was actually one of many capitalizing on the dance megatrend initially announced on record by Hank Ballard and his group, The Midnighters. The Twist, from 1959, was the first culturally enforced dance of the commercial rock and roll era, and also the first completely alienated dance form. Instead of being part of a pair line couple or group, Twisters were dancers who were liberated from stifling community. They were individuals. The Twist was a revolutionary force in breaking apart social units and enforcing individualist ideology. The rock and roll music had existed long before this dance. The introduction of the twist was a shift which punctuated a profound new beginning for rock and roll. Before the twist was introduced, a night of dancing, even if it were a wild folk or jazz affair, featured people dancing with partners, sometimes many different partners, in a single night. <laughs> Oftentimes, these dancers danced very close to one another. A dancer was someone who was felt, smelt, held, and who moved in tandem with their partner's body. Sometimes there were dance cards issued so that dancers could reserve spots for intended consorts or cut in. Indeed, emotional pleas from the beginning of the rock era implored lovers to save the last dance. The final dance of the night in the pre-twist era, typically a slow and romantic number, was symbolic of the committed lovemaking of a partnership, as opposed to the evening orgies, countless tawdry quickies. With 
couples dancing, an orgiastic night of simulated fornication with multiple partners could be enjoyed by otherwise monogamous pairs who would let the night away, their vows technically intact. Then the twist came in, permeating all social classes, propagandized into paradigmatic status with a hype campaign extraordinary even by its contemporary psy-op standards. Pop envoys like Sam Cooke, the Isley Brothers, Gary U.S. Bonds, Petula Clark, and countless others brought the good news to the masses. French singer Stella satirized the ubiquity of the sensation with La Parent's Twist, in which she sang, how sad it is to have stupid parents doing the twist. <laughs> my, mother, my mother has a fashionable haircut, which makes her look ridiculous. It took four years of incessant twist propaganda for the dance to completely infiltrate all sectors of Western society with the twist records reaching saturation levels in 62. A twist in literature and film is an unexpected turn of events or a shift in plot. The twist dance signaled such a shift in consciousness on a worldwide scale from which humanity has yet to recover. After the twist came other dances, the fish, the fruit, the horse, the cow, the swim, the holy gully, the camel walk, the James Brown, the Popeye, the discophonic walk, the monkey, the gorilla, the kangaroo, the drive, the funky Broadway, the cat, the fish, the bird, the cow, the tighten up, the loosen up, the sophisticated sissy, the handshake, the Philly dog, the alligator, the twine, the Harlem shovel, the Boston monkey, the shake, the shimmy, the cat, the wachusi, the shingling, the boogaloo, the bounce, the freeze, the continental walk, the slide, the four corners, the Broadway, the fishing pole, the happy feet, the mohawk, the past the hatchet, the mashed potatoes, the fly, the popcorn, the karate, the African twist, the barracuda, the beetle hop, the drive, the water, the frog, the duck, the ostrich, and a multitude of other crazies, <laughs> or would be crazies, ensured that the dancer would always dance alone. Many were reenactments of animal behavior, such as the monkey dance, where the participant acted out primate pastimes, such as the peeling of a banana. <laughs> With the bird, the dancer flapped imaginary wings. In a sense, the dances were a funeral rite for life in the garden. With industrialization, humanity had realized its biblical prophecy and banished itself from the natural world. Food in the post-war period was, for the first time in recorded history, packaged without trace of its origins. A few years before, pigs, chickens, and cows would have been visible within city limits, and butchers, fishmongers, and greengrocers would have plied their wares at the market. After World War II, food became something that was shrink-wrapped, freeze-dried, instant, boxed. The dances were designed as a celebration of this de-evolution. The artist, a gleeful prophet, was announcing the people's lack of agency, absence of will, and absolute subservience to the powers of totalitarian industry. After the, the new individualist dance crisis were so exhausting as well as 
psychically and physically devastating that they lasted only 10 years, from 1959 to 1968. By 1969, dancing was all but forbidden by rock bands, who insisted that their audiences sit obediently and consume drugs en masse while trapped in enormous arenas, raceways, pastures, and superdomes. The rebellion of narcotics had the appeal of being hermetic, secretive, and illegal, but their real purpose was to escape from rock itself, which had become intolerable. <laughs> rock and roll's alienation had defeated its victims, who were now rendered exquisitely passive, like the undead. Occasionally, the trend for regimented dance moves would reappear, either as camp, with the disco fads, such as Disco Duck, the birth of Upbody and the Hustle, or as satire, with punk's pogo and slam. But these attempts faded fast, impotent raging against the dying of the light. With the death of dancing, drug abuse became the rock fad, another step in the alienation of the music victim, lost in noise, buried in stone cacophony. After the quiz. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, this one's called The Pill. Get it. The Pill. 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 Before this, alongside the twist, oral contraceptives or birth control pills made their first appearance, first marketed in 1960. The Pill, though developed years earlier, not made into the marketplace, stymied by the FDA's moral and health concerns. The twist forced the agency's hand. Just, just as Adderall and Zola are part of a tool set required to navigate the cyber internet consciousness efficiently, and increasing loneliness and alienation engendered by cyber society creates a need, the need for drugs like Prozac, so is the pill a necessary invention in the newly twisted world. The, the new paradigm demanded. The pill is widely credited for launching the so-called sexual revolution and for sparking a new era of promiscuity and rebellion against a nuclear family unit and its oppressive gender roles. But the pill and the twist, along with other post-industrial dances, didn't only encourage more sex without regard for pregnancy, they also parented a new relationship to, to sex. People engaged in intercourse with lots of different people, not because they were newly carefree, but because dancing, the ancient ritualistic pantomime of intercourse and intimacy, was now an alienated action, an individualist task, where the participant was required to be alone, in a frenzied, masturbatory state, both highly stimulating and deeply depressing. The void had to be filled with actual fornication. The two phenomena, therefore, are related. The twist from 1959 made the pill, the pill absolutely necessary, while the pill, 1960, made the world engendered by the twist manageable. The pill. Meanwhile, to dance now required working knowledge of new dance moves, which once the twist went sour, were always in flux. The disc 
Discotech was a place to announce one's adroit command of moment-to-moment consumerism. Dances were like gadgets or jokes which showed off working knowledge of temporal ephemera, leisure time, a requirement so as to learn and practice new moves, and buying power so as to purchase the records which were necessary components for instruction. At the disco, when the latest 45 barked out the contortion of the week, the dancer was ordered to comply with the locomotion, the turkey trot, the whatchamacallit, the choo-choo, the bump, the lion hunt, the after the pops, the shotgun, the shake and bump, the funky walk, the wash, the sophisticated boom-boom, the monster walk, the lurch, the stereo freeze, the moon walk, the broken hip, the bounce, the weirdo wiggle, the squeal, the Tennessee wig walk, the Philly dog, or the pimp walk. Once dance partners were non-existent or incidental, specters and shadows gyrating in the flashing half-light of the dance hall, hallucinations in the night. Sexual consorts were similarly identityless. Sex likewise became extracted from what it had been, universal and eternal, and became a consumer's whim, a new move, fashion. It was necessary for the rock and roller to engage in actual sex because of the lack of tenderness. Touching one another casually had been made verboten by the new dances. Therefore, the conceit of the sexual revolutionary wasn't only that those involved were having more sex, but also that they had liberated sex entirely from its olden days gulag of repressed courtship rituals and teasing. A spate of tease songs appeared in the early 60s, bullying diatribes against Little Sally Tease by Don and the Good Times, and other women who weren't complying with the new era of mechanistic sex on demand. The Fugitives, No Tease, Cliff Richards, Please Don't Tease, and the Montars, Your Tease, are some examples. No pill! Yeah, the next one is called Nordic Functionalism and its Relationship to Pornography. Um, okay, are you ready? Let's go. Nordic functionalism and its The stag dancer and the kinetic unattached lover were archetypes which were necessarily encouraged under capitalism. An isolated population is more easily manipulated, misled, shorn of its possessions, its money, its self-respect, and its sense. Romantic dissolution, the breakup, is the ultimate example of the imperialist's tried and true divide and conquer strategy. Corporations want the desolation of love, a population alone, miserable, confused, and in a state of pornoholic sexual desperation. Mega corporations, Apple and Ikea, are closely linked to the pornography industry, aesthetically, philosophically, and economically. While home computers' popularity and ubiquity stemmed from their use as crypto porn proliferators, both Ikea and Apple's design stem from the ideology which spawned modern day adult movies. Nordic functionalism. Indeed, the ideas of Nordic functionalism, a design philosophy which eliminated the buttresses, gilding, and facades of old architecture in preference for clean lines and modernity, resulted in the modern pornographic paradigm. Though functionalism began as a version of Le Corbusier and Bauhaus architecture, it ended as a total Belton shower. <laughs> Along with the thrills and indulgences of old time design, this doctrine of socialistic simplicity swept away the clutter of the old world Baroque and courtly sex play and distilled it into the highly efficient erotica that is now standard fare. From its late beginnings, when Denmark led the world in decriminalizing smut, 
Norse pornography has been like a science expo, brightly lit and clinical, an exposition of dispassionate technique and disregard for feelings, touch, communication, and affection. Form furiously follows function. Porn action, instead of being a lascivious sleaze fest, replete with a contrived story arc, as it was in the blue era, era of smoker flicks, began to resemble lab data, lab work, with moans and groans inserted like test data, pellets fed to rats. Nordic functionalism and its Sex, during the so-called re sexual revolution, was itself reinvented. Rock and roll stance has always been that it invented sex, that original sin had been reinvented. Sex was redefined as an ultra-individualistic sport of play and pantomime. Eros, once risque, naughty, inferred, and discreet, now became stark, narcissistic, and codified like the new dances. People practiced their moves, first through smut, then with post-hippie how-to manuals such as the joy of sex, and then finally with hardcore pornography as their guide. Pussy eating, cock sucking, anal sex, rim jobs, threesomes, wheelbarrow, and the 69 were outlined, streamlined, diagrammed, and stripped of mystery. The cobwebs were clear, and a tungsten bulb was blasted at the newly clinical <laughs> sex act. Without risk of pregnancy, and with the new brutal aerobics of the frug and the jerk, banishing intimacy, closeness, and tenderness, the teen amphetamine world of rock and roll began a whole new sex scene. This started with the guttural obscenities of the first rockers. But though Elvis and other first waivers gestural feats led the way, the twists and Nordic functionalism were the coup de grace, which finally did away with the sexual tenderness, the moonlit dry humps, and the backseat ropes of the old world. <laughs> Nordic functionalism. <laughs> 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 dedicated to everybody. <laughs> the traditional and the adjustable <laughs> the traditional and religious establishment confused feeling old and left out of it objective. Therefore it was left to self-styled sexual deviants and social misfits to explore the outer edges of this brave new tundra. New sex scene. New razor technology was also introduced in the new age to address the compulsory youthfulness enforced by the new adolescent rock and roll class. Formerly, counterculture had sought wisdom and experience. The beat generation had wanted to look mature and rugged, as had the bohemian jazz enthusiasts, the zoot suitors, and the hustling spitters. They sought wisdom from the past and the other. Now people shaved whatever facial hair they had so as to maintain a young look. Not coincidentally, perhaps, shaving technology became quite sophisticated in 1957, immediately before the twist appeared, with Gillette <laughs> marketing the first adjustable razor, which allowed a closer cut than ever before. But all this shaving had another function as well, to enforce insensitivity, mil militarism, and a brutal machinist ideology. 
Hair acts as an antenna on the body. Hair on one's body makes one sensitive to one's environment. Religious people are typically hairy and resolve not to cut their hair, lest their relationship with God, via their antenna, be severed. Hasids, Amish, Rastafarians, Muslim Orthodox, and Sikhs all have edicts about maintaining certain hairs or hair that is sacred. Samson is the biblical story of a hero who lost his power by cutting his hair. When the Greeks and Romans successfully conquered their respective known worlds, they were remarkable for their lack of beards and for their decision culturally to be without facial hair. Lucius Tarquinius Superbus, a Greek descendant, was the last of the kings of Rome. 530, the kings of Rome spanned 535 to 496 BC, before the Senate era, and also the man to introduce the razor to Rome. Lucius shaving himself signaled a paradigm shift which brought about his own defeat. The beard was signal of the monarchic father authority, while the shaved face was androgynous and democratic. The razor excited new passions, which struck with a dialectic fist. Shaving leavened time and blurred identity. Old could be new, uh, old could be young. Masculine could be feminine. Identities were revealed to be mutable and a craze for democracy was the result. Lucius's dynasty was overthrown and gave way to the senatorial Rome of historic renown. After he was deposed, the newly shaven Roman Republic was declared, which then set about conquering the known world. The Romans had taken their democratic model from the Greeks of Athens, who had also been known to shave and oil their bodies, as had the Egyptians who inspired them. In antiquity, the Athenians maintained an empire in the Peloponnese, demanding slave and treasure from their neighbors. The Romans eclipsed Grecian conquests and have been the aesthetic template for, the most, for most imperial projects since the National Socialists, Bismarck's Prussia, 1930s fascist movements, Napoleon, Great Britain, and the USA, whose neoclassical buildings, the eagle, and symbol and the fascist wall adornment at the U.S. Congress are but a few examples of the USA's repetitive and unimaginative invocation of Roman power. Our sexual ideas are also borrowed, not from the sophisticated cultures who created the Kama Sutra, but from kindred brutalists, the Romans. Roman depictions of sex in the ubiquitous brothels of Pompeii, which feature Priapus centrally, are curiously similar to images of modern pornography. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much. Thanks a lot. And um, this is our last lecture for today. Um, it's going to be called. Adjustable Razors, part two. Um, Adjustable Razors, part two. Hairless tribes were dominant over their hairy neighbors. <laughs> Besides hair cutting, rituals of self-mutilation were symbols of tribal potency. Circumcision, an obvious example, was not religious, but a cultural designator of toughness and exclusivity. In parts of the world with more history, such as Asia, it's theorized that relative hairlessness had developed as an evolutionary trait of survival. As the Greeks and Romans showed, less hair meant military prowess and dominance <coughs> over foes. Hairiness was a sacred trait, reserved for non-combatants such as holy men, poets, philosophers, crazy people, and nursing mothers. Similarly, shaving one's body desensitizes one's body. It makes one more machine-like, more macho. It makes brutality easier 
Once hairiness was associated with leftism, the fate of that ideological propensity was doomed. <laughs> with the sexual rev revolution, people started shaving not only their faces, but their pubic regions as well. This began with an avant-garde of homosexuals, but spread with the popularization of pornography via the internet and so-called hook hookup culture of casual straight sex performed by squares. <laughs> the shaved body signals a person who's not hung up by attachments, feelings, romanticism, or any of the tawdry aspects of relationships or love. <clears throat> the shaved body, the shaved crotch, was one that was ready for wordless action steeled against vulnerability. Onlookers of porn complain of the childlike resemblance of the shorn genitals, that the shaved crotch looks prepubescent, which makes them uncomfortable. And such is the intention. The shaved pubic area is meant to look pre-adolescent. It denotes a pre-adolescent disregard for the potency of sex in regards to emotionalism, romanticism, etc. Pubic hair paradoxically doesn't protect the sex organ, as is assumed, but extends it. It is a sensitive part of it. Chopping off one's pubic hair is akin to cutting the foreskin or female gen genital mutilation that persists in some parts of the world. It's designed to desensitize. Violence-worshipping youth cults, such as the military and the skinheads of Great Britain, typically shave their heads as a designation of sociopathic unfeeling. The hair, instead of protecting or hiding the organ, actually comprises thousands of feelers which lend sensitivity, exposing it to its partner's signals of empathy, love, lust, shame, fear, disgust, etc. A hairy body is simply less prepared for modernistic, mechanized body mashing. Hairlessness is an aggressive stance and implies a lack of vanity and disdain for luxury. It implies a state of war. A French-style waxing job or landing strip is like the so-called Mohawk haircut favored by the Pawnee tribe and used in times of war by Cossacks, airborne troops, and the like. The Brazilian wax job is the full skinhead. <laughs> in the pre-twist era, the dancer would often dance with many partners in a simulated orgy. It was a tryout for sex, essentially, or a replacement. But in its explicitness and its intimacy, it could not be called repressed. After the twist was introduced, sexual repression saw its apex in the mania, or alienated and displaced erotic cavalcade which met the Beatles and other stars of the era. <laughs> After the disappointment engendered by the Beatles' breakup came a mass culture-wide depression. Soon afterwards, drug abuse became practically compulsory for teens who liked music. This was another replacement for sex. The sexual revolutionary revolution celebrated as a liberation which encouraged participants to have more sex and more partners was actually a revolutionary transformation of sex, changing what had been the sex act into a series of alienated self-conscious moves, or replacing it with a sensual high of the institutionalized culture of drugs. Thank you very much.
Does anybody uh, have any questions? Steiner? Yeah, I'm um, Can you talk a little bit about the relationship between vampirism and white Well, you know, that's interesting that you say that, because, um, well, I think that, yeah, van well, you know, it's interesting, because, it, you know, maybe vampirism, like rock and roll, is something that's, you know, you can impress a lot of different meanings on, it's almost like a, it's a thing, you know, it's a thing. But Devil in Bram Stoker's book, Dracula, which popularized the vampire myth more than anything else, seems to have a subtext of, you know, it's a you know Victorian white suprem supremacy and explanation, of, or a, you know it's a kind of explainer of imperial, you know, the, you know it, it coincides with the height of the eugenic ideology and, and and maybe the height of the British Empire too. So I you know if you read the book it's definitely it's definitely racially obsessed like a lot of you know, literature from the era. And um, it's definitely about, you know, you know, purity. And Dracula wants to go to England because he sees it as the most pure place. <laughs> go figure, I don't know. Anyway, does that, uh, I don't yeah. know. Yeah. I had a follow up. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, could, you, uh, could you offer a, a definition of rock and roll in your mind, you know, just Reform. Well, I think rock and roll, that's an interesting question because when it captured the imagination of the world, it was when it was really primitive. And everything since the very beginning, and we can't really know when the beginning is, it's like confusing. There's a lot of debate over it. But, uh, but it's like um, people long for the return to the garden, you know? And that was even happening in the late 50s. People are talking about oldies in the late 50s. So it's already, and there's, uh, you know, odes to Buddy Holly, you know, tribute to Buddy Holly by Mike Berry. So there, there was already in a, in a very nostalgic self, uh, you know, you know, it was, a, it was already a kind of talking, but anyway, to answer your question, it's, um, it's about this gesture, you know, it's a gesture of you know, a pure gesture of expression or emotion, really. That's what rock and roll is, and that's why, you know, so every permutation since the very beginning, whatever that is, is kind of a, it's like toying with the idea, you know, do you, how, how close do you want to be to the pure gesture? But that's really, I don't know, to me that's, that's what it is. It's like a symbol, it's like a simulation of free, you know, freedom or something, you know. So, El, you know, Elvis, it's like, wow, you know, they did that, or whatever. It's like, wow, that's crazy. So, that's why rock and roll, it doesn't really matter what the record is a lot of times, you know, or it doesn't matter, you know, it's about that gesture of, you know, it's a, a gesture of, you know, kind of liberation from reason, craziness, insanity. It's a moment of insanity. But it's um, defined against pop as well. I was thinking, driving in the car, I'm always listening to the regular radio, you know, and there's really not a rock and roll. Like, is there like a contemporary rock and roll at the moment? Rock is dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but so that's, I mean, I guess, yeah. To just no, well, you know, that's interesting when you say that because rock, yeah, it's like, it's like that thing, of, you know, Run DMC called the record King of Kings of Rock because they were saying, well, this is rock and roll. So it's a really like, well, then the question is, what is rock and roll, and, and where, how far do you extend it? Because if you look in a rock section, besides this arbitrary demarcation between black and white music, which is like bizarre, actually, there's really no way to understand what rock and roll is. And so all you can, all I can see it as, as is uh, electri electrified music. I think it's music that harnesses the power of electricity. And that's why Dylan's conversion was so traumatic for the fans of folk, because it was like, well, when he went electric, it was like, well, that was, that's the whole, very symbolic. It wasn't that the music changed. It was that the use of electricity was symbolic of it being harnessed by this other force. You know? Because folk, you know, of course, as I explained in Soviet, was really a kind of 
covert, it was really a front for socialist ideology, which had been outlawed and destroyed by the FBI. You know, well, it was it focused a lot of things, but that was a strong strain in it. You know, it was like Pete Seeger resisting Kuwak and you know the black, you know, people, and that's why you fellow travelers were. It was like a hush hush communist sympathizer thing. So anyway, so when Dylan went electric, it was really like. <laughs> because it was, you know, that that's what put him in the rock and roll character, and just kind of like electrification. But even that was a little bit arbitrary because I'm sure people were using electricity in folk. It was more the manner, of, you know, as all these things are. There, it's some, there's some, you know, there's some symbolic way that it's done, you know, which might be lost to us now because the winners are the history books, so it's really impossible to understand what people were thinking at the time, you know. Looking at the, your comment about folk, can you talk a little bit about the pendulum going the other direction when, like, the government implemented and set up tours for jazz musicians and brought groups to penetrate the Iron Curtain and try to, like, present ideas to, during the Cold War, ideas that would cause propaganda to occur that made us look or seem more liberal or made us look or seem freer? Yeah, I mean that's a, I, I mean that's funded or or just outright fronts. The main the main I mean most of the most influential American art magazines were you know supported by the company. So it's abstract expressionist shows all that yeah, stuff yeah. federally funded. Yeah, so you know and, and you know and only uh, you know only, it would be naive to assume that rock and roll and you know what didn't wasn't part of this. Yeah, anything that felt free. Oh, wait, oh, yeah. first you and then Okay, um, you talked about Pussy Riot and appropriation. Um, I was wondering if you think that, or like, if you believe that Pussy Riot is um, like themselves appropriating a something or they're being appropriated by like, Yeah, I think they're being appropriated. I think that there's something weird about the way that they've been, you know, just some amount of publicity. I mean, we live in a country with over three million people in prison. And a lot of them are unjustly in prison. So when you see hysteria about a foreign situation, you know, at the with the volume you know, the shrillness and intensity of pussy right, who are obviously it's ridiculous that they're in prison. It's insane. But when you see the you know the kind of publicity machine that goes into work, well you have to wonder what's behind it. You know, that manipulation. And a big part of it is, you know, for any political, you know, I don't know why the government cares about public opinion, but apparently it does. And uh, <laughs> a big part is enlisting liberal support for things it requires a lot of the weaponization of women's rights, gay rights, things like that. So just like we bombed, you know, or not we, I didn't. <laughs> but just like the U.S. government bombed Afghanistan for women's rights, you know, the pussy riot is a big exploiter for the nascent right. You know, Russia right now is uh, has all this gas money, and uh, and that's obviously, I mean, all the conflicts in the world typically revolve around oil, the control of resource, you know, the control of gas and oil. So, you know, the Ukraine is uh, positioned very strategically between Russia and oil in Europe. So, if they can, you know, if the U.S. and NATO can uh, occupy Ukraine, then the oil can go to the West. Do you think that Well, they want to get rid of Putin. And, I mean, honestly, with the kind of intensity of anti-Putin propaganda, I wouldn't be surprised if he was assassinated by the West, like Gaddafi and Saddam Hussein. I mean, there's no, there's no, it's not unimaginable. You know, in my lifetime, it was unimaginable that the USA government would behave like the mafia and uh, assassinate world leaders. But it's really, uh, or so overtly, like killing Gaddafi. Like you know, uh, you know that's pretty crazy. So 
nothing is out of bounds with the R government. That's what I think. That's, but, you know, it's a, obviously Pussy Riot are activists. It's kind of like the whole dissident thing in the 60s and 70s, where, like, you know, somebody like Yevgeny Yevgeshenko or Mikhail Baryshnikov would, suddenly, would come to the USA or to the West and suddenly be celebrating this. Like, they're, the, they're, they're the greatest exponent of their art. Mikhail Baryshnikov is the greatest ballerina in the world. How do we know that as Americans? We don't know anything about ballet, at least I don't. <laughs> but we accept this, and critically, we say Mikhail Baryshnikov is the greatest ballet dancer. So, which means that maybe if I went to uh, <laughs> North Korea, and you know, maybe the North Koreans would be like, Antonio is the most, he's the most incredible rock singer, <laughs> and the most popular rock singer in America, you know? And the North Koreans, I don't know what their knowledge of rock and roll is, but I assume that it probably they might go along with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I think, but anyway, obviously, Pussy you right, they're activists in their own country, and I think that's, you know, they're obviously really brave and courageous people who have, you know, a particular ideology, but, you know, the kind of, you know, any, you know, we all know people who do guerrilla theater. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you, you've all seen, you've seen the protests. You've been in the protests. You've been in the protests. You, have you seen them? You've got this kind of, like, and have you seen, a, but have you ever seen a group as well photographed as this? <laughs> I mean, I know a lot of groups that want to be really popular. They can never get their shit together. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> anyway. But, uh, oh, yeah. So I uh, just thought about this in the Pussy Riot uh, court hearings, and they are placed in this glass box where they give their testimonies. And uh, I, I thought of, like, if we think of rock and roll as something that was sent to these European countries, and it was always sort of lived inside a box, as if I would connect with your Nordic functionalism, that it is sort of something that is American and it comes inside this container. Then, like, do you think it functions differently here, or is it sort of like this? Uh, I just had this idea that it is always thought of uh, that it doesn't have true power where it might have such, because here it's supposed to have true power, but it like can't be then like sort of compartmentalized. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Well, you know, I mean, that's why every group wants to have their record. Band. That's why censorship, we should all support censorship. You know, the artist is always talking about censorship. Well, the artist who talks, who speaks against censorship, doesn't believe in the power of art. You know, dictators believe in the power of art. They say, oh, this is, you know, we're going to outlaw this, and that's bad, blah, blah, blah. It's only a neoliberal society that, like, erases all meaning and accepts everything. That's ridiculous. As artists, we should be promoting censorship. We should, like, be encouraging censorship. It's Hollywood movies that, you know, and, and, and censorship would be great because it would get rid of so much shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, all these Hollywood movies where everything, like, the, the other thing is censorship is a total lie because if, if they were allowed to, I mean, this idea of freedom of, you know, whatever, I mean, like, look at, I don't, you know, I, you know, well, it would. You know what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, what I'm saying is, you know, obviously, like, political content is stripped, and also outright pornographic images are never used for, like, you know, uh, Coca-Cola ads. So, obviously, censorship exists, it, it, but it exists in a very... It's a, it exists in a way which tends to, you know, I don't know, it hides itself. We need overt, we need explicit censorship. Like, oh, they banned my book because it, you know, had a steam passage. That would be <laughs> sorry. Anyway, sorry. Uh, so you, you sort of touched on this a little bit uh, before, but bringing up the idea of the beats, and um, there's the whole uh, uh, period of time where there was, like, uh, appropriation of black cultural, uh, like, or subcultural 
things that were getting appropriated into pop culture, and like how how much of the like the status quo was like maintained through the appropriation of black culture into pop culture music and like the idea of like cool being appropriated from like black cultural um, yeah. well, standards I, and that was happening at the same time like politically and that, I don't know, maybe you have more Yeah, I don't know, that. I mean, that, that's, it, it's interesting, I mean, it's definitely like, you know, you know, the way that we all act and, you know, is, you know, it's, if you ever see the, uh, the concert for Monterey, or the Monterey Pop Festival, mm -hmm. the film made by D.A. Penn Baker, well, there's a DVD of it, <laughs> and it's got some extra footage. It didn't make the cut. <laughs> and it's a lot of the groups that went out of vote afterwards, like the association, people like that. And it has uh, a lot of uh, extra footage of Buffalo Springfield and people like that. Anyway, what you really notice is that in 1967, everybody's a real nerd, you know? <laughs> and they get on stage and they're like, you know? And they're, they're, they're all still using this kind of coffee shop, you know, this kind of very explicit showbiz, you know, that, that rock and roll with, you know, performers expected, expected to be very, um, in, the, in the white milieu, was expected to be, uh, you know, uh, personable and guide the audience through the performance, make some little jokes. And uh, and then Hendrix comes out. And Hendrix, of course, is really just, the, you know, the, you know, the, you know, Hendrix, everything Hendrix was doing was kind of, you know, normal if you were going to see the, you know, Junior Parker or the Isley Brothers, you know, but in the context of, white pop music, you know, with the moms and papas, it seemed like, you know, extraordinary, revolutionary. So he comes out and everything's inferred and it's a very cool. And then, you know, then, anyway, that becomes a paradigm and now nobody would get on stage and talk like the association did. Because, you know, that, that you know, that moment, which was, you know, by, by Woodstock, everybody's acting like Hendrix, you know, they're just, ecstatic state. <laughs> they're just, you know, ecstatic. They're in a euphoric, they're in the gestural, you know. So, I don't know, but, I don't know, that doesn't answer your question. I don't know. <laughs> but, yeah, cool, you know, cool, it's a, cool was an appropriation of being a junkie, you know, and of course, you know, heroin came into the USA, it's, you know, that's a big government. <laughs> Just on that point, though, and bringing up Hendrix, can you talk a little bit about kind of black music being appropriated by by all of the white groups and producers, and then what it meant when he did Watchtower? Because that was kind of like a first thing, taking Bob Dylan and converting it in public into something completely okay. different. Yeah, I'm not sorry. I don't mean to say Jimmy Hendrix just like, Ooh, uh, what? but you know, I mean all this, you know. But just <laughs> taking a white person's music opposing white people taking black music. Yeah, but you know, John Coltrane, my favorite things. Do, do you know what I mean? Right, so right. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. But maybe you're right, I don't know. I mean, like, I think that, uh, yeah, rock and roll, it's really black, and it's, but it's also really, you know, working class and street. It was essentially considered like pornography when it came out. It was basically like bubble gum. It was like, Porn or smut or just some nasty thing, and and it was actually run. It's interesting because the economy around rock and roll, when it was in the garden, before before we left the garden with the Beatles, it wasn't corporate really because the corporate the companies didn't know how to how to they didn't know how to market this stuff. So uh, it was you know so Scepter and Wand were run by like a black woman, and uh, a lot of the labels were run by. They were run by African Americans and uh, teenagers and women and people who were shut out of the corporate structure. So it wasn't until you know the early '60s when it was sort of like, whoa, we have to do, you know, we have to get this thing, and that's when the British invasion happens and makes rock into, you know, a white, you know, expression or whatever, you know, and all those guys were very explicit about their sources and they were very like, they, you know. They wanted everybody to know that uh, the Bobby Parker, you know, that they were playing Bobby Parker song, but you know, ultimately, 
it's uh, that's what changed it is when it became corporate. And uh, so yeah, you're right. Then Hendrix comes in, and uh, yeah, no. yeah. I mean, yeah, that's like another permutation. But that's uh, but we still have these segregated rock and soul record aisles. I don't know. Sorry, that doesn't make any sense. No. <laughs> any other questions? Oh yeah. Steve, uh, how you thought about just the idea of the remix? Oh, the remix. Well, the remix, you know, it's funny that you say that because, you know, because once upon a time when records were coming out constantly, you know, because at one point, you know, when rock was more gestural and there wasn't so much, things hadn't been codified, people were less scared to do it. It was just novelty music. It's essentially telling a joke. A rock and roll song is, you're just telling a joke. So it could be a shaggy dog joke, it could be a Dada joke, but it could, you know, it's basically, so you're, your 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 chorus is just a punchline, you know, essentially. That's really what it is. See? So, like when you look at early rock and roll, it's like a bunch of fun jokes, and then and then once the jokes become cops, excuse me, once they codify the jokes, it's like oh, these are the good ones, and these are the quality ones, and like there were so many really good joke tellers that were like got really intimidating for people, um, and that's when I think you know before you had these response songs. Like, the whole idea of originality in rock and roll was really, that's really a, like a later thing, you know. In the beginning, it was like people would just take the recycled riff that the other person used and then put, turn, you know, make a response song, you know. I, nobody was getting sued for doing that. But then in, when rock and roll became corporate, it became, you know, this thing about, oh, well, the, you know, like George Harrison got sued for My Sweet Lord and the people who owned the publishing to my sweet, the song My Sweet Lord, All Things Must Pass. Where it said, well, this is exactly like the chiffons, the people who own the, the publishing for the chiffons, key so fine, um, were like, this is the same, these are the same notes, and they got all the money from that record, which is a huge hit, international hit. But anyway, uh, but that was a new idea of originality, and it was totally weird, and that's why I think you have the remix, because instead of having a response song, you know, you had to have. People wanted to hear the same song. Like in the old rock and roll era, it would be like you you play a song like a, you know you know like a, like a, I'm trying to think of a good example, but uh, you know like uh, well, there's so many examples. There's like thousands of examples. <laughs> <laughs> but like you write a song, but like let's say it was called. Foot stomping, you know, and then somebody else can release a song that sounds the same, and it would be called like "Stop Stomping Your Feet" or something. <laughs> and then, but then, and then you see the last of that with uh, hip hop, with early hip hop, with Roxanne's Revenge and all that stuff, because that's the last, that's the last moment when rock and roll was gestural. You know, the early hip hop where it's just like it's fun, it's like a joke. And uh, but anyway, once. You know, once it goes out of the garden, then it becomes about this, oh, well, this is the special thing. And then you're going to get sued if you caught, you can't just make a response song. So you have to do a remix, I guess. Because people want to hear the same thing over and over again. <laughs> a lot of disc jockeys get really insulted because people come up and they say, like, oh, do you have any, you know, do you have Lady Gaga? You know, and they're playing some sublime. <laughs> or not sublime the band, some, 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 some sublime thing, and people are like, oh, well, you really play Lil Wayne, you know, or whatever, and you're like, you Philistine. But, but in fact, yeah, it just took a little heat. Look at that. It's pretty sick. The speakers are supposed to be and they can't move. Yeah, I think you have to have something moving. It's an active job. That's why the light guy used to get on the fly. <laughs> or the light company. So, um, so anyway, uh, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah. But anyway, but people want to hear the same thing. And that's why the DJ can't take it personally. Because people don't really, they just want to hear, hear something familiar. And, and, and mostly I said it was production quality or the production. It mostly has to do with the method of the recording or the way it's recorded. You know, like when you turn on the radio, I don't know if you're me, I'm talking about me actually, I don't even recognize what I hear as music. 
<laughs> but when I DJ, people who are there don't recognize what I'm playing as music. So it's just one of those things, you know, it's just like, I think you just, you're looking for the familiarity, and you're like, oh, well this isn't familiar. How can I shake my ass? <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? I want to win Oh yeah? Um, do you think there's any hope for sex? I mean, is it just is hair? It <laughs> I mean, is there, I mean, because the hair thing is huge. It's totally huge. It is huge. huge. <laughs> also, electric lights. That ruined everything. <laughs> I mean, really, think of candles. That would be so nice. Would you say you're nostalgic? Yeah, yeah, I'm a very conservative person. <laughs> no, no, I'm not nostalgic. I'm I didn't looking mean, for I something just new. It I just no, really, I, not, yeah. I, just, was... I think that uh, nostalgia, you know, nostalgia for a time is uh, nostalgic, it's a bad rap. It's really a potent emotion. And can, I, I think... can I elaborate on my question oh, yeah. to you? Because I think there's this tension that's interesting about this, there's this longing for this like linearity or even like codified social, you know, the dance. The twist was so interesting, it's like breaking away from this codified and, and, and possibly better, maybe not, time when there was sort of the sense of honor and ritual and, 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 and duration to relationships. Um, and then that sort of tension of them like to be revolutionary, to like break all that apart and to break out of these stupid nuclear gender role family things. And, and how can these coexist together? You know, like how can we have a, a world where there's censorship and linearity and also a sense of being free and liberated and revolutionary, you know, like, what's, yeah. what, what's the... No, that, you're right. I feel like it's that's like the... I guess what I don't like is the triumphalist, you know, narrative of most modern culture, where it's like, whatever one, it's like, oh, well, that was the greatest. And, it, and it's considered, it's like a dialectic progression, like, oh, well, of course, you know, that happened, because it had to happen. And so, for me, a right. lot of what I'm interested in is, like, well, why did that really happen, you know? And why, and what are the forces behind that happening? You know, it's like, you can say, you know, you... You, if you're into history, then you're, you know, you just see these, the, you know, the, mo the kind of pop explanations for our historical predicament are often really, you know, uh, you know, they're absurd and offensive, maybe. So mm -hmm. I guess when I see things like, you know, like when you think about, it's not that I'm nostalgic, but it's more like, but I do like, I do, yeah, I do have like a weird, like I love, you know, driving here down Broadway and seeing all the fucked up you know, theaters, and I was like, wow, I love this, but then think of it, if I'd known when, when the theaters were around and they were thriving, I probably would have hated it, you know? <laughs> so, I really, yeah. because we're a bunch of assholes, you know? <laughs> but, so to see it as this, like, just dilapidated thing, it just seems so cool, and I'm like, wow, if only you could just hang on to that, but that's weird. I mean, is it, is it the privilege of a generation that grew up in some sense of analog time and space and then has crossed over into this other space that, yeah. I'm, I asked this as my own. Yeah, no, no, it's really, really weird, you but know, you're, you're, yeah. You know, where, how do you? But it's also this thing that, that like, we, we're, we, we live in a world right now that's traumatic because every day you have to absorb some new system. It's like, well, you have to download the new system. Like, oh, well, of course you should. <laughs> you have to download the new system. And it's just like, it's insane, you know? It's like, it's, it makes everybody into like this kind of like incredibly like useless, you know, person, because everybody's <laughs> constantly relearning. You're being, you have to be reborn every day because every day you're like, oh, well, you don't know how to use, you actually don't know how to use Final Cut Pro anymore. <laughs> or whatever. <laughs> you know, the thing that you actually, like, busted your ass trying to love, well, now it's useless. <laughs> like, you know, I remember when, you know, when the, the whole graphic thing happened and, like, you know, computers came in and all these people who learned to use a T-square and bought all those expensive erasers, Suddenly, all that knowledge was destroyed. And that was a, like a, mm -hmm. a whole, and it's happened now, but they, they were the first. Yeah. But now it's happened to everybody. So everybody's been made, you know, redundant or useless. And, you know, it's, it's, it's just, let's face it, it's traumatic. It's even traumatic for young people who have no other experience, yeah. you know? So it's really a of try. I mean, and, and that's when you realize, well, that's what being old is, you know, because you're essentially, you're seeing, you know, events, and you can't explain to anybody, well, oh, like, uh, and, 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 and if you do explain it, then you're, 
you know, fuddy daddy. And, <laughs> and that's why old people are so angry. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the whole nostalgia accusation or question is really interesting and problematic. And I know it's just shouting for yes, old people are angry. But actually, I, I'm, I'm quite sort of um, fearful of this, of, of a kind of, um, uh, if, it's, if if someone says, "Oh, Francis, of course you don't like Miley Cyrus. You probably thought Britney Spears was um, wasn't as good as Madonna," and it's like, well, actually, they're very, very, di you know, like the fact yeah. that you can actually analyze with a historical um, toolbox the differences between things does not make you a hater or make you like obsolete. It's like. I feel that, that, that the contemporary sort of uh, predicament is so hostile towards analysis. Kind of historical analysis. Yes. Hello. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I don't know. No, I, I, I agree. You know, this is a speech that I've been, you know, giving on stage, which is like, there's this enforced positivity. And like, if you're not just like ejaculating, you know, <laughs> positive statements about everything, you're someone who a negative, like, oh, you're negative, you're real creep. Like, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you didn't like the movie? God. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Really and that, so it's like, it is weird that the, the Prozac, this kind of enforcement of positivity that's everywhere is like, it's really like, and, but you have to uh, like examine, well, what's behind that? Well, maybe analysis is just, at this point, things are going, so, you know, things are going this way where, like, since everybody has to know how to do everything, you know, you like, if you're an artist, you have to, let's face it, you have to know how to do pretty much everything. You have to be an accountant, you have to be, like, a publicist, you have to be a, a film editor, you know, you know, like, this whole thing of, like, the destruction of, you know, that started with when Kennedy took off his hat, you know, because there used to be roles for people. I'm not nostalgic for that, I'm just saying. But anyway, the point is now you have to do everything, so it's like, it really is like, maybe there's just no time for any analysis for people, you know, you're just kind of like, like, let's not, have, you know, you know what I mean? Can I also say that if I if you grew up in the generation who is, let's say, educators or parents or whatever, were already analytically critical of most things, then the starting point for thinking is criticality, rather than the, like, there's something positive that then you crush, but you started with someone crushing the... the when my... You know, the, when <laughs> I that's why you want the Being critical was the sign of sophistication. <laughs> you were supposed to hate everything. <laughs> and if something kind of came into the, good, into the good category, you were like, oh, wow, that's crazy. <laughs> like, wow, that's really good, you know? But now it's kind of, everything's cool. We're not going to judge anything because it just is, you know, which is also, honestly, I'm really jealous. I wish I had an attitude, but instead I hate everything. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you very much.